Hey Alexandra, would you mind uh, trying to share your screen, please? Your, your presentation? Just to check it, Absolutely. please. Absolutely. Thank you very much. How's this? Yeah, it's working. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, my name is Rafael Evangelista. I'll be the moderator of this session. I'm a, a professor at the University of Campinas and also a council member of uh, CGBR in Brazil. Um, this uh, workshop today has the title Toward a Resilient Internet Cyber Diplomacy 2.0. And let me make a brief introduction. As an environment full of uncertainties, deepened by the permanent increase of malicious activities online, cyberspace demands its sectors to develop resilience tools to ensure its integrity. In this sense, the Internet's open architecture challenges the role of the states. Not only have the considerations of non-state actors become relevant, but, al but also geopolitical dynamics impact the digital world, demanding more holistic, long-term and cooperative strategies from, from states. In this sense, cyber diplomacy emerges as a value tool uh, as a valuable tool for open dialogue channels that en enable transparent, transparent discussions with stakeholders. However, theory and practice become complex when several issues are still clearly undefined, and consensus relies on different interpretations of what proper online behavior would mean. In this regard, we aim to shed light on cyber diplomacy developments from different national and regional perspectives. 
focusing on public attribution, sanctions, and active cyber defense. Thus, we have a brilliant set of speakers for today's discussion. But however, uh, before presenting today's speakers, I would like to inform you that unfortunately, Ms. Uh, Livia Sobota will not join us today due to a conflicting agenda. So the speakers of today's sections are here in my, at my left, Ko Koichiro Ko Komiyama, has been a visiting scholar at Keio University's Global Research Institute since 2016 and director of the Global Coordination Division at the Coordination Center for, of the Japanese Computer Emergency Response Team, which he joined in 2007. He has been working on cybersecurity capacity building projects for years, both in Africa and Asia. After Koichiro, we'll have Alexandra Paulus, is the project director for international cybersecurity policy at Stiftung New Verantoin Tovoing. Sorry, <laughs> I'm Brazilian, it's a bit difficult for me. She holds a PhD in political science from the Schermnitz University of Technology and is a non resident fellow with the European Cyber Conflict Research Initiative. And after Alexandra, we will have Veni Markovsky is an advisor and advocate of international internet policy and cybersecurity. He current, currently works at ICAN, ICANN's vice, as ICANN's vice president, serving as the primary liaison to the United Nations, discussing internet policy with diplomats from every country, participating in major conferences and keeping ICANN community abreast, abreast of the UN, U, United Nations role. Okay, so uh, each speaker will have uh, maybe an, uh, up to uh, 15 minutes to expose their initial thoughts. Uh, following, we'll have a short debate among the different perspectives raised by the, speaker, the speakers, and then we'll be devoted to an open Q&A, so prepare your questions. Um, so let's start with Koichiro. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, or good, uh, hello, good morning, uh, wherever you are. My name is Koichiro. Uh, I'm the director of uh, Global Coordination Division at JP3, Japan Computer Emergency Response Team. And I'm also, I'm also a part-time scholar at the KU University. So in, in short, I'm a uh, cybersecurity practitioner slash uh, scholar in, in the area of international relation and global governance. Uh, and let me be clear, I'm not speaking for government of Japan uh, and not representing uh, our government. I like to begin with, I like to begin with reminding on how cyber diplomacy is important from my own experience uh, because Perhaps tech community uh, sometimes do not believe that diplomatic negotiation will improve cybersecurity. Uh, sometimes even diplomats do not believe that they can change the, the other state's behavior by negotiation. At the very least, uh, they think it will take, take years. My responsibility at JP3 is to respond to cybersecurity incidents. Uh, dated back to 2015, for years, we have observed, responded, very sophisticated state-sponsored attack from our neighboring country. And that affects Japanese businesses, uh, Japanese companies a lot. Uh, on September that year, 2000, September 2015, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited the United States to have a U.S.-China summit. Who remembered that summit? Uh, there, they hold a summit, and they agreed upon, among other important agenda, they agreed upon both U.S. and China will not conduct commercial cyber espionage to one another. They, they pro prohibit the cyber spy, in other words. Like any other agreement, 
I knew it wouldn't make any difference, at least to, um, to my own business. Uh, and I believe, I, I thought the, the cyber attack will, will continue regardless of the agreement, uh, regardless of the agreement. But to my great surprise, the number of cyber attacks dropped dramatically after this agreement. And I have been with JPC for 15 years. Uh, and at the Christmas of 2015, the December 2015, we really have no business. We only have a few cybersecurity incidents that, that we should respond or we should handle. And that was the most peaceful Christmas I have ever had in my you know, career with, with JP Third. So from this experience, I realized the power of diplomacy or power of diplomatic or po political negotiation. It is powerful enough to change the, change the life even outside of signing party. Okay, the, the agreement prohibit the cyber spy to US or to, to, to China. And that agreement affect the cyber attack to Japan, reduce the cyber attack to Japan. Um, and it is, its impact can be seen in few few months. <coughs> there are many other agreement, declaration, pact, uh, and I'm proud that I contributed some of some of those, you know, uh, agreement for to to reduce cyber security incidents. Uh, however. Um, I still have to say none of those agreement was very, has very little tangible effect when compared to this 2015 Obama and Xi Jinping's uh, US-China agreement not to do cyber espionage. So now you understand diplomacy really help reducing cyber security incidents. And the bad news is, the bad news is uh, this agreement did not take effect for a year. On next Christmas, uh, I was very busy again responding uh, many cyber attacks to Japanese companies. But it, it's a good news that at least for few, for few months, someone attacking to Japanese company prohibit their activities, so cease their fire. So that's the power of diplomacy. Now. My second point is uh, cyber diplomacy has been changed in the last few years. Uh, so I'd like to piggyback with the theme of this workshop, Cyber Diplomacy 2.0. Uh, the rule of the game has changed. States have always sought to secure their national interests using a combination of diplomatic, military, economic, and informational means. And technology has transformed the influence of each instrument. Cyber or internet is one of those. Diplomacy, as I understand, is a mean to pursue national interests. That, that's my, my, my definition. And the objective in cyber diplomacy has long been to ensure national security in cyberspace. That's for sure. Of course, there have been other agendas like uh, like capacity building, human rights, freedom of expression, and others. But the central focus has always been on how to protect one's nation from cyber attack, for, from incoming cyber attack. Some try to apply existing theory like deterrence, public attribution, that are developed in different areas. So I call this cyber diplomacy 1.0. The main players in the in the game of 1.0 were military superpowers, namely US, China, Russia, and a few others. Within the government, this is an area fall under the control of foreign affairs, defense, sometimes intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies. They discuss in various international fora, UN process for sure, uh, but other security organizations like NATO, 
OSC, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and others. This is how diplomacy 1.0, cyber diplomacy 1.0 was played. Move on to cyber diplomacy 2.0. Over the past five years, cyber diplomacy has been transformed. Suddenly we realize how valuable our data is. We realize that computer cannot function up in the air. And what we admire as cloud computing is just someone else's computer. And so we must ensure that we must ensure where's the safest place we can store our variable data. In the game of cyber diplomacy 2.0, nations not only looking for security, but they want those commodity in their own control. So that's the, that's, that's the game of 2.0. To control more data, nations build data centers, lay undersea submarine cable, uh, attempt to store data uh, at their own territorial, uh, their own sovereign soil. The main players in this new game are big tech, in addition to, of course, states. And this is because big tech is in a position to directly control the, uh, the everyone else's data. Within the government, ministry in charge of IT or ministry in charge of trade and economy, uh, they have been take key role in this negotiation. And there are many ongoing discussions of the trade regime, like WTO, uh, other trade agreement, RCEP, TPP, not TPP, uh, and, uh, and others. So this is cyber diplomacy 2.0, in my understanding. And the point is, cyber diplomacy has been upgraded to the arena of economic and trade issues as well as security. With this upgrade, stru structure of confrontation has changed. Previously, it was a competition against, uh, against uh, Western democracy versus Eastern uh, autocracy or authoritarian states. Uh, in 2.0, it, it is a competition for resources that's why even between the United States and the EU, who shares most, most of common values, are sharp library in this new game. Now, I'd like to finish uh, my remark by where this game is going, or what I think where this game is going. Only two countries on this planet are very well positioned in in both game in both games, diplomacy 1.0 and diplomacy 2.0. Diplomacy 1.0 is a traditional competition. Country with military power have advantages. Diplomacy 2.0, population matters because human activity is the the largest uh, source of data. Country with, countries with largest population are like the oil producing country in Middle East right now. So they should be, they must be very rich because they possess very rare resources in their own hand. So name country with advanced military capability and large population. And only to, to my to my understanding, only two two country can you know fit in these two different criteria. It is China and India. Two will two country will shape the future. Everyone except China and India. We need to find a way to get along with them. We really need to talk to them. Uh, now, uh, next year's IGF will be held in my country, Japan. Uh, sure, we have many participants from China and India because it's accessible. So IGF 2023 Japan, you cannot miss it.
to find a way for your country, for, for your nation to survive in the, uh, in the game of cyber diplomacy 2.0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Koichiro. Um, let me hand over to Alexandra, please. Thank you so much, um, and a huge thanks to the organizers of this session. Um, so my name is Alexandra Paulus. Um, yeah, sorry for making you try to pronounce the very German name of my organization. Let's just call it SMB. Um, working with the abbreviation, uh, we are a think tank based in Berlin and we work on tech policy and I am with them um, in the international cyber diplomacy, uh, sorry, international cyber security policy team where I focus mostly on cyber diplomacy and issues of international cyber security policy. Um, and so what I would like to, uh, yeah, which, which idea I would like to throw around here and share with all of you, and then I'm um, looking forward to the discussion afterwards, is um, first of all, focusing a little bit about the opportunities and limits of current cyber diplomacy instruments, and then, yeah, la launching this idea of cyber resilience diplomacy as a possible way forward um, to keep in line with the theme of this workshop. Um, so... First of all, which policy instruments do we have at our, or we as states, do states um, have at their disposal for responding to cyber operations? Um, although, of course, states are not the only actors, and most of these require close collaboration with um, non state actors like private companies, um, the technical community, civil society, and academia. Um, so, the first Necessary condition for responding to a cyber operation is, of course, to conduct an internal attribution. Um, this can have technical, political and legal aspects. Um, and uh, this is then the basis for all other action. Um, and by the way, if you are interested in hearing more details about this, this is all based on a study that I noted here um, that my colleague um, has has published. <clears throat> so then the first instrument corresponding is information sharing. Um, and so this is a picture of the German Bundestag of our national parliament, um, which uh, was, uh, yeah, fell victim to a uh, Russian cyber espionage operation in 2015. Um, and we know that it was the Russians, not because our incident response or forensic capabilities are so great, but, but because we got a little help from our Dutch friends, um, because at the same time, um, certain Russian uh, operatives were also active and targeting um, organizations located in the Netherlands. Um, and so Dutch intelligence shared information on, on what was happening there with their German counterparts, which then allowed the German counterparts to conduct this internal attribution of, of what was going on. And this got a lot of media coverage, of course, because the, the, the perpetrators were targeting also the um, office of uh, Angela Merkel, of our chancellor at the time, and her MP's office. So information sharing, instrument number one. Instrument number two is then public attribution. Um, so the, the screenshot you see here is um, of the EU High Representative Statement, uh, Josep Borrell, um, who publicly attributed the Bundestag cyber operation to um, the Russian GRU. Um, so this is the second, second instrument that, that states can do, um, make it public, name and shame, etc. Number three is then diplomatic measures. Um, so this can be, of course, a wide range, um, like Koichiori, um, like you just so uh, eloquently put it. Um, diplomacy contains the whole breadth of activities that a state can conduct um, to yeah, build and maintain relations. Um, and so this would often include things like a company could call in the ambassador of another country that was supposedly behind a cyber operation. Um, but then recently, this year, um, I, I got an example that works uh, well here, is a bit more illustrative. This was when Albania cut ties, um, diplomatic ties with Iran over a cyber attack. Um, now, of course, this was not only due to a cyber operation. Um, this was due to a larger conflict between, between the two countries. But what sparked it was a cyber operation on Albanian systems um, that they attributed to Iran. So this is also something that states can do. Um, and fourth, we see this a lot that the US uses this, um, using criminal indictments to, to respond to an operation, um, publishing yeah, a criminal indictment um, and uh, pressing charges against the perpetrators of cyber operation in the hope um, that this, at least in the long run, constrains their activities. And then 
Oh, yeah, sorry. It's it's gone a little bit. Supposedly, you would see here. Um, it's of course, uh, now behind the other picture. Um, uh, is sanctions. And you would see here a screenshot of the EU sanctions um, that were passed also in response to the Bundestag operation of 2015 against um, an organization and certain uh, yeah, affiliates, uh, people of the GRU um, who are behind the Bundestag operation. And this is really where the spectrum would end for most states, I would say. Um, so sanctions are, so to speak, the sharpest the sharpest sword um, of cyber diplomacy. Um, in theory, there are also other uh, options like intelligence operations. Um, this is here a new newspaper article reporting on a, a person um, that was affiliated, allegedly affiliated with ISIS um, that was believed uh, to be killed in a US airstrike conducted by the CIA. Um, and then this again is coverage of um, the Israeli Defense Forces that responded um, to uh, cyber operations conducted by Hamas hackers um, or Hamas operatives with an airstrike on the building. So military operations are, of course, in theory, also possible. But again, for most states, these are probably not part of the spectrum, which is why I put them in a lighter shade of orange. Um, mm -hmm. So keeping all this in mind, this is sort of the spectrum that we have. Um, what can we see? What are current yeah, current or maybe structural challenges of cyber diplomacy. And then in the second step on the next slide, I will sort of draw my own conclusions of how we can maybe move this forward. Um, so the first very general challenge, of course, for cyber diplomacy is, like Kuchiro said, where we try and apply um, these very established diplomatic um, instruments or activities um, like negotiating norms, uh, doing uh, or, or building confidence, building measures. Um, it's, of course, very tricky because we do have the dual use problem and it is not uh, not easy to classify certain um, yeah, pieces of software or even pieces of hardware um, as civil or military in their use, which then makes it very complicated to do things like expert controls or even confidence building measures in a meaningful way. The second, of course, is the attribution challenge. So the spectrum I showed before started with internal attribution. As long as that is really tricky, and now, of course, many actors have become a lot better at this, but as long as, long as this remains elusive for certain actors, um, then it is really very hard to respond at all to any cyber operation. And even if we attribute an operation to maybe a certain IP address or, or certain assets, it is even more challenging to determine political responsibility, which is when where non-state actors come in or you have hybrid actors, um, which just makes this um, quite a headache for policymakers in this space, I would say. So what can cyber diplomacy do? Um, I would say it's really playing the long game um, and many of, of cyber diplomacy efforts should be seen as long term investments, um, but usually without immediate short-term gains. Um, there is also in many cases dissent about practical applications. So for example, when it comes to the development of confidence building measures or even of cyber norms, um, this is being discussed very intensively right now at the United Nations and in other forums. But when it comes to what does this actually mean and how, what would it look like if states applied, um, it, it, it's still quite complicated. And then, of course, also politics will be politics. So, I mean, I've been working on cyber diplomacy for a while now, um, watching this space at least since 2018. Um, and you do see that just broader questions of political constellations have a very strong impact on the extent to which we will see movement forward here or not. And so, uh, yeah, I, I will take my chances and say that we will probably not see terribly much progress in the coming months or years simply because of of factors that have very little to do with cyber diplomacy and very much to do with broader like political constellations. So what does this mean um, or how can we maybe move a little bit forward? Um, this is where I would introduce what I would call cyber resilience diplomacy. Um, because also our workshop here has, has the subtitle of um, a resilient internet. Um, so again, just I work at a think tank. I start things with a definition. That's what I do. Um, so I'm stealing here the NIST 2020 definition of cyber resilience um, because I think it's quite helpful. Cyber resilience means the ability to anticipate, withstand, recover from, and adapt to adverse conditions, 
stresses, attacks, or compromises on systems that use or are enabled by cyber resources. And so again, what could this look like? What would be, um, what would such a cyber resilience posture look like? And again, I've also written about this with a colleague. Um, so if you're terribly interested, I'm happy to share um, the link to the article that has a bit more detail. Um, so dividing a cyber resilience posture into domestic policy and, and foreign policy. So what, what would be cyber resilience diplomacy? Um, on the domestic side, a few examples for what this could look like. Um, would be, for instance, creating data embassies. Um, so this is something that Estonia has done. The German government is also contemplating this. It's basically creating digital twins of data that is so essential um, to the functioning of, of, of government um, that it's stored in supposedly or hopefully safe, um, safe locations in third states that even if um, these uh, national systems at home were to, were to be destroyed, whether that be through a cyber operation or simply an earthquake, um, or depending on where you're located, and then you have a backup. Um, so it's basically backup for national data. Um, this, of course, tremendously increases the resilience and makes it also a lot less attractive to target these systems at home. Um, second idea, threat hunting. Um, so really focus on um, on um, monitoring your systems more closely, look at what's going on there um, to possibly preempt um, uh, cyber operations that could otherwise have, have very devastating attack, um, effects. And third, also conduct regular cybersecurity incident exercises at home um, or even with international partners just to see how what processes would look like if a cyber operation were to take place and to really practice what processes would look like to, um, to be prepared when the time comes. What would this look like in a foreign and security policy context? Um, again, what, what would cyber resilience diplomacy mean here? One idea is improving the resilience of, of transnational critical infrastructures, um, because this is really where incentives are quite well, well aligned among states, that it is um, in, in nobody's interest that these go down, whether these are uh, fiber optic cables uh, or other yeah, uh, uh, parts considered the public core of the internet, like the DNS system. So um, states should really focus on improving the resilience of these structures um, to, to enhance the posture of all. Then a very strong factor, also conduct cyber capacity building activities, but aim them at resilience in other states. Because then in the long term, um, this will reduce the attack surface in these states um, and then hopefully in the long term, reduce cyber operations overall. Um, and then finally, simply setting international norms um, that a cyber resilience approach is a sensible one um, when it comes to international peace and security. Because this is cyber resilience is really a non-escalatory approach in contrast to other approaches um, that are a bit more um, yeah, active or persistent. Um, and so it is really in many states' interests that the international community writ large um, focus on a cyber resilience posture. And one way to, to set such international norms is to design your domestic policies accordingly. Um, and uh, so what are the advantages of such a cyber resilience posture? Um, I see four main advantages. First of all, this threat actor agnostic. So this provides a viable solution, whether your main focus, main problem is maybe currently ransomware or is other uh, state actors targeting your systems. Um, it's also simply a more realistic view of the threat landscape. Um, so looking, for example, at the most recent report here in Germany, uh, cyber operations have been steadily increasing over the past, uh, past years. Critical infrastructures are increasingly targeted. So it is simply, Focusing on resilience and focusing on getting systems back up and running is just a very uh, sensible use of resources when these resources, um, and that is both money and people, are very scarce. Third, um, especially a cyber resilience diplomacy approach focuses on improving cyber security both abroad and at home, uh, which should be in, in most states' interests. And then finally, since it's non-escalatory, it will contribute to international peace and security. 
And so, um, again, I wrote this all down in this article here. Happy to share more. And now looking forward to, this, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I'll hand over to Veni, please. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. I see notes. Yeah. And I can see my transcript now. Uh, so I, I come from ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, but I also have to uh, make sure that I don't, I can't, I'm not speaking here on behalf of ICANN. The only person who can do that is our CEO. But I'm going to share some of the work that we are doing um, and I will explain why we are doing it. And then um, listening to our uh, other panelists, uh, uh, I, I probably will uh, have a couple of questions for them uh, when we will later come to the Q&A session. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers, by the way, for inviting me and thanks to the uh, government of Ethiopia for hosting the IGF. I, uh, I understand it's uh, quite a good success and it's been going on well. And there are a lot of people there, uh, which I miss. I couldn't be in, um, in Addis right now, but that's life. Sometimes we cannot be where we want to be. So, uh, I'm the, as you, as you were saying, I'm the vice president for UN engagement and people may start asking questions like why is the U I can engage at all with the UN and other intergovernmental organizations? Well, it's actually related right to the topic that we are discussing. Uh, all these conversations about cyber diplomacy are inevitably coming to uh, focus to the UN. And the way it's happening is through different uh, groups that the United Nations General Assembly has been organizing. So for the past several years, there has been um, a group of governmental experts, which was uh, appointed by the Secretary General. It was limited in numbers uh, and there were experts from different countries providing uh, advice to the uh, and issuing reports when they had consensus. But in the last few years, actually, this has changed besides having or outside of having such a small group uh, of experts the General Assembly decided to create two parallel processes. One is called the open-ended working group. And that includes open-ended means it's open for all governments. That doesn't mean it's open for other stakeholders. And the other one is called an ad hoc committee. The ad hoc committee is drafting a uh, cybercrime convention. So talking about norms, uh, you know, if when the UN passes uh, or accept the cybercrime convention. It will be the second one after the Budapest Convention, which will be dealing with uh, issues related to cybercrime. Uh, so it will be interesting to see, you know, what kind of norms there will be and what kind of uh, text will show up in this new convention and what will be the difference from the Budapest one. Um, the On the open-ended working group, uh, which is dealing with all issues related to cybersecurity, it's supposed to issue a consensus report, again, that means all the 193 member states of the UN have to agree. And even if one disagree, there will be no report. So it's a very delicate diplomatic work that is being done. Uh, what we do at the UN actually is we do provide briefings for the diplomats. Um, you, some of you are familiar with the fact that the diplomats are coming only or primarily from foreign ministries. So they not necessarily understand how the internet functions. Uh, only rarely you would see a diplomat who has some engineering background or technical background, computer sciences, etc. Uh, so we actually talk to these diplomats, we organize briefings for them and we tell them, we explain to them, we provide information uh, of uh, how the internet functions. We also, um, for, well, I mean, this is important because when they negotiate behind closed doors, uh, their, you know, norms of behavior, etc. We want to make sure that some people in the room, if not all, are aware of how the internet functions and what they do and what text they pass will not uh, impact the security, stability and resiliency of the internet and will not lead to its fragmentation. Um, we, as uh, within the, within, within ICANN, there is this government and intergovernmental organizations engagement team, and we actually publish papers on um, the deliberations that are taking place at the UN and at the uh, International Telecommunications Union and other organizations as well, intergovernmental organizations, 
uh, one of my colleagues will put a link in the chat um, where you can download uh, all the papers that are there. They're also available in other languages. You can choose your own language on the top of the page and download the text in your uh, language of uh, better understanding. So not only English. And uh, we also have country focus reports. Uh, we have published so far three, one on uh, China, one on Russia, and one on the Netherlands. This might be of interest for people who are uh, interested to know more about what these countries are doing, uh, both internally with regards to the internet, but also externally, how they approach the internet at the uh, different intergovernmental settings. Uh, we believe that, you know, this is important uh, for the ICANN, or not only for the ICANN, but for the broader community to know what's happening at these intergovernmental organizations, because uh, what happens there inevitably will have an impact on the internet. And I can provide some examples from the past. Uh, some of you may, have, uh, may know that the IGF actually didn't come out of nothing. The Internet Governance Forum was created by uh, a summit called the World Summit on Information Society, uh, which took place in 2003 in Geneva and 2005 in Tunisia. And um, it published uh, the so-called Tunis Agenda. You can find it, download it, read it. There. It's, it's an interesting document and it was created with the participation of all stakeholders. So not only government, but also civil society, technical community, academia, etc businesses. Um, and this, so this document, uh, this WISIS, WSIS or WISIS, um, there was a review of this process in 2015. So this was called WISIS plus 10, 10 years later. Uh, and uh, in 2025, there is another process coming at the United Nations General Assembly called WISIS plus 20. So these are the places where people are discussing not only what the future of the IGF will be, but also whether countries can talk to each other, reach agreement on basic issues related to the internet. And these are the, these are the meetings which we urge people to attend and to pay attention to, because when we talk about cyber diplomacy, it's being built nation nationwide, but it eventually is always coming to either bilateral or multilateral negotiations because public policy is the prerogative of the governments and international public policy is being decided at, uh, at these venues like the UN. And uh, there were some attempts also to move some of the conversations related to cybersecurity and the internet to the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, in some of our papers, you may find uh, interesting details about governmental officials' uh, statements at the UN or at the ITU which are talking about the way the internet works. And you, you can see that we, we, in the papers, we had to provide context so that the readers would understand what actually it means when some governmental official says something, for example, that, uh, let me just make sure I'm quoting correctly, that um, uh, I can, uh, has uh, the, the possibility of, um, cutting off a whole country from the internet. So ICANN doesn't have that power, neither has any other organization that uh, is running the internet or that is engaged with the internet. In fact, we've seen in the history that there are many countries which have tried to shut down the internet externally so that it's um, uh, kind of only in the country and that hasn't been very successful. The internet tries and manages to connect um, no matter what um, governments do. Uh, but also, um, we also think that uh, since we are at the IGF, we think it's important to pay attention on the future of the IGF and it will be decided in, again, at this, this WISIS plus 20 negotiations in 2025. Um, we find that the IGF, and I've been involved with the IGF since the beginning, uh, I personally find it uh, a very good opportunity to interact with other people, to find out what's happening around the world to make sure that uh, we stay on top of things, you know, and uh, we talk to each other. In fact, most of, many of my contacts uh, are people I've met at the IGF uh, right from the beginning until, until even now when we are, uh, or I'm participating remotely, but there are people on the ground, but we still stay in touch using, you know, all the technologies that we have. So the, the bottom line here is that we're trying to, um, 
bring knowledge, uh, technical knowledge to the diplomats who are negotiating cybersecurity and also uh, make sure that they understand that ICANN as an organization is not there to lobby for ICANN. We are there to provide factual information. We are a neutral technical body, you know, which makes sure that the DNS and the IP addresses are functioning all the time. In fact, a few days ago, I think we were celebrating the 35th, uh, 35th anniversary of the DNS as we know it. And uh, we are trying to, to make sure that, you know, people understand that uh, about the services that are, they are using on the internet, that's not the internet as we know it. And there are two different types of handling the internet. So there is internet governance, which is dealing with everything on top of the technical uh, internet governance, which is what ICANN and other organizations from the technical communities are doing. So, I mean, I, I can, provide a lot of anecdotes and examples from uh, our experience with uh, with governments at the UN, at the ITU. Uh, it has been extremely interesting to, and some of those actually are uh, in our papers, uh, including the country focus report, which I highly recommend that um, you read. Uh, the fact is that uh, this year, 2022, was uh, quite important because um, uh, there were elections at the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, there is a new Secretary General elected. She will be stepping in her office on January 1st, Doreen Martin Bogdan. Uh, she's um, a candidate who has worked uh, at, the U at the ITU for quite a while and has a lot of uh, good background and has been involved with Africa because she is currently heading the Developmental Bureau of the ITU. So I, I could point you again to uh, our country focus reports on Russia, because there is a lot of information there since the, there was another candidate from Russia who was running for secretary general. And they were running on a platform that uh, was mentioning that uh, uh, the current uh, uh, internet governance is not working well and it has to be moved under the ITU and stuff like that. So. I don't want to, I mean, I can talk for hours, but I don't want to obviously take the time for questions and from, from my colleagues. So please stay in touch, um, follow us on, uh, subscribe for our papers. So more are coming. We, you know, we're going to be reporting what's happening at the UN this year and at the ITU. And I hope uh, that I'll be able to answer some of your questions later today. Thank you, Veni. Uh, we have some uh, a set of questions that were uh, prepared by the, the organizers, and uh, I'll start to uh, with Koichiro. Yes, um, the first one revolves around the public attribution. Uh, do public attribution of cyber attacks work as a cyber diplomatic tools to constrain inappropriate behavior online? What are the challenges perceived by you to make this a feasible tool? Should it be used by uh, at all? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, public talking about public up attribution, uh, I, th I think government of Japan to this date uh, made three different, uh, you know, uh, three, three different public attribution uh, to for cyber attack from North Korea and one uh, for cyber attack from group affiliated with, no, sitting, uh, located in China. So, so not accusing Chinese government, try, try not to offend, um, you know, the entire Chinese government. That's, that's probably the, you know, Japanese strategy uh, in, in this area. And, uh, I think uh, Florian Erugov and Max Smith, uh, they are both from Switzerland. Uh, they wrote an excellent paper back in 2021 uh, on a framework for the public attribution. And the central argument in that paper is that public attribution is a highly complex and uh, highly complex process which requires uh, trade-offs of multiple consideration. In this case, trade-off for trade-offs, for example, uh, uh, for example, uh, of course, we have a risk of ending up wrong attribution uh, by uh, inaccurate intelligence. Uh, 
uh, even in a successful case, even in a successful public attribution case, uh, a country may lose the intelligence sources. Uh, and that means more public attribution does not necessarily mean better strategic results. Uh, then even among close allies, uh, there are gaps in the amount of information they have. Uh, let me take an example of a war in Ukraine. Uh, the war in Ukraine triggered the various cyber attacks. The most important lessons from this war, lessons for me, was the importance of in information or intelligence that uh, big tech in the United States possess. Uh, under the surface, U.S. tech companies provide a variety of information to Ukrainian government and military. Uh, and without those information or intelligence, not, in, not only for Ukrainian government, many government cannot do precise attribution without, uh, without that type of uh, information. And this gap between in the capability of government and private sector is very different from legacy national security uh, issues. So looking back, the government can monitor nuclear weapons, uh, the satellite up in the air provides where ballistic missile has launched within uh, seconds or minutes and government has full access to, to that, that type of information. Uh, even some government can attribute the objects in uh, satellite orbit. So compared to field of nuclear weapon, uh, deep sea and uh, satellite orbit, government has has very limited access or very uh, very limited information that can support their own decision for public diplomacy i think people in this room uh, may have the philosophy that the government should be as as minimum as possible however i re i repeat that we we should not rely on the goodwill cooperation of big tech to provide the intelligence because that's that's really the basic of uh, their political strategic decision thank you um, alexandra instead of handing over to you uh because you already uh, touched a little bit about this this topic i was thinking about uh, handing over to over to to Veni, and then later to you is that okay okay Okay, so please, Veni, uh, do you mind, want me to repeat the question? Sure. Uh, do public attribution of cyber attacks work as a cyber diplomatic tools to constrain inappropriate behavior online? What are the challenges perceived by you to make this a feasible tool? Should it be used at all? Uh, so I, I will share here some observations which I've seen at the UN uh, at meetings that you know I have attended uh, because obviously this is outside of the scope of work that we do, um, which is uh, the, um, there are always, the diplomats are very careful. When they talk, they never name countries. Uh, they always say, I mean, uh, they always say certain countries or some countries or a country. Uh, when uh, the attribution is being done at the national level usually, and you know, that is provided usually with some facts and evidence. Uh, we have seen also uh, cases where years later, some discovery may show up, you know, and uh, an attribution will turn out to have been correctly or incorrectly um, stated. But I think the, the way uh, the, the, the diplomatic tools are working is, first of all, uh, you know, these countries are talking at the UN about norms of behavior in cyberspace. And there is always the perception that some countries will follow those norms, but others won't. And so those that follow the norms would be in a um, 
bad position or worse position, you know, because they follow norms and others don't. But I think the very fact that they're talking about creating norms of behavior, the very fact that uh, those working groups, the open-ended working group and the group of governmental experts have actually issued several reports with consensus. That means that it's possible, dialogue is good, and it's possible to reach consensus even when uh, heads of states would say that they don't work with other countries, but we see the opposite at the United Nations. Because think about something, in order for the open-ended working group to publish a consensus report. That means all the countries were talking to each other and even countries that may not have necessarily good behavior between each other, their diplomats still will have to talk or at least will have not to object to something said by the other, else there will be no consensus and there will be no report. So I think we should be a little bit more positive about the, the opportunities that diplomacy gives and uh, you know, we should encourage our governments and uh, we should talk to our governments and we should offer their, our like technical uh, uh, expertise and whatever other expertise that we may have in the countries where we are. I mean, um, everywhere uh, more expertise is better than less. And especially when we talk about the internet and the fact that, uh, you know, countries are discussing the, or negotiating the future of the internet and uh, we need to make sure that there are enough room, enough people in the room who have the skills and who have the knowledge so that again what they do does not break the internet that, that, that does not lead to its fragmentation thank you thank you Vanny. uh please alexandra you want to add something on that or maybe comment on your colleagues answers please feel free Yes, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so I would start with the question, like almost turning the question on its head. I mean, the question is why should we attribute um, and what is the idea behind it? Um, and so I think if people believe that the public attribution of a cyber operation in itself will change very much, um, I would not necessarily agree. Um, I would, however, argue that the power of attribution or the reason why it makes a lot of sense to think about public attribution as one tool in the toolbox is, like I said, that attribution is the basis for other responses. Um, and so uh, if, if actors decide that they do want to respond to a cyber operation, I think the first credible step is to conduct a, a public attribution. And here then, uh, where, where I think it gets really interesting is to look also at how these attributions are being done. So what is the standard of uh, proof or of information provided, the technical evidence provided um, together with, with the mere statement that we attribute this cyber operation to actor X? Um, is this convincing? Um, and is there a technical evidence? I think this is where it gets really interesting. Um, when we look at how, how are attributions increasingly being done, we see that there is a tendency um, or has been a tendency over the past few years to conduct um, increasingly collective attributions. Um, so first we saw this mostly among like-minded states, but now interestingly, um, uh, we're also seeing that um, China recently attributed a cyber operation to its perpetrators, right, to the US. Um, and so this is Increasingly, I would say that states have, have or are discovering this as one tool in the, in the toolbox um, to have more meaningful debates about state responsibility um, and also things about uh, factors like due diligence when it comes to non-state actors. Um, then finally, just one thing I wanted to share because I think Koichiro mentioned this, um, it's the the fact where do these attributions actually come, come from? Um, and so this is of course where we then move to the area of um, intelligence ga gathering or intelligence sharing. And here I just wanted to point out that it's interesting to see that um, on a, in the European Union, um, where we have this quite elaborate cyber diplomacy toolbox, attribution is explicitly not part of the toolbox. And why is that? Because there is only a very limited mechanism for sharing intelligence information among EU member states, um, which yeah, the efficacy of which uh, people are discussing, <laughs> let's just put it that way. Um, but so this is why attribution, even though it is so central to responding to cyber operations, is not even part of the EU framework. Um, 
And so I think this points to the limits of, of collective attribution and then also to, to doing what I suggested before, which is providing proof for attribution, which I would hope would on the one hand contribute to having a more substantiated discussion about responsible state behavior in cyberspace, but on the other hand is of course quite problematic because not necessarily are you, if you want to attribute a cyber operation, terribly interested in sharing just how you find out, found out what you found out. Um, and so this is where I think it gets really interesting and where um, it will be, yeah, attribution will remain with us <laughs> um, for a while, I would say. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, we have here uh, two more questions, but uh, to opt optimize our time, I'm going to make one question to Veni and then the second question to uh, Alexandra and Koichiro. Is that okay? Oh, uh, let's start with Veni. Uh, what are the particular opportunities for cyber diplomacy and the way forward to better protect the internet? Please. Uh, thanks. And um, I, I think uh, I, I mentioned some of it, which is uh, uh, the most important part, part really is for the countries to talk to each other. Uh, and the, the way to do it is also to even even when they are not like in they don't have good uh, bilateral relations they should find some common ground uh, on when we talk about the internet because the internet is actually it's almost like the air it's everywhere and you you can you can still have some requirements about the quality of the air in the in your borders but inevitably you know the wind will bring other air and you it's it may not be with the same quality so unless we we make sure that the internet is functioning uh, as a single interoperable internet around the planet. Well, we won't have all the um, good things and all the virtues that it's bringing and all the possibilities that is opening. And let's not forget also that uh, we have a lot of people who are still not connected. And that means there is a lot of um, need for infrastructure development. There is a lot of need for um, uh, bringing hardware and software and and building communication and other skill, computer skills in, in people around the world, this cannot happen without diplomacy. And cyber diplomacy is just an extension of the normal diplomacy. You know, it's not anything different. So I think we, we just need to urge our governments to make sure that they uh, a, have expertise when they go and negotiate uh, cyber related issues so that they don't break the internet and be uh, make sure that we can provide them with that expertise, uh, whether this is going to be done through like uh, CGI in Brazil or the Internet Society of Bulgaria in my own country or uh, non-profits uh, like the Institute in Germany, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we, are, we, we should be sharing our knowledge because if we share our knowledge and expertise, that's good more people become knowledgeable and more people, including diplomats, obviously. And I, I, I cannot stress enough on the fact that, you know, in only three years, there will be a World Summit on Information Society review at the United Nations General Assembly, and we all have to pay attention starting now. I, I think actually, I mean, we, some of us have already started paying attention, but we should make sure that we are part of this conversation because once you're at the UN, don't forget that once you're at the UN, it's only governments, it's not it's a multilateral organization it's not a multi-stakeholder like other organizations you know including ICANN so people uh, businesses academia civil society they have to engage with their national governments in order to make sure that the interests of the users in their countries are protected and the internet uh, is protected thank you Veni uh, Alexandra let me uh, make you another question uh, do cyber sanctions alone work to shape behavior online? For which actors could it work or have been working successfully? And then the same question to Koichiro. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you, Rafael. Um, yeah, so I think this is a very relevant question because so as I said before, I would say for most states, sanctions are sort of the sharpest sword. It's at the end of the spectrum. And then the question is, of course, how sharp is their sword actually and how how helpful are these? Um, so if the idea behind sanction is, sanctions is really to change behavior, I would say that that's a very quite high objective. Um, I mean, when, when we look at how are sanctions being deployed in response to cyber operations up until now, 
um, we see that most states um, uh, yeah, pass two types of sanctions. These are either uh, travel bans or asset freezes. Um, but this also means since these only refer to um, travel and assets in the respective states jurisdictions, or in the case of the EU, in the jurisdiction of the whole union, um, the effects of these are well limited. So as long as states do not enter these respective territories um, or don't have any assets there, then the sanctions have zero direct effect. The idea here is, of course, to, again, play the long game and think that this will over time create chilling effects, so to speak, um, and may change the calculus also of, of non-state actors, basically of people considering uh, going into, into the, maybe affiliating themselves with, with the armed forces or the intelligence agencies, whoever is responsible for cyber operations in a certain country. Um, and um, that this will not be terribly attractive anymore because they, they will know that they will not be able to travel to certain jurisdictions, etc. But this is a very long-term game. And again, these effects are not immediate. Um, I think it could be interesting to consider a bit more to what extent um, other kinds of sanctions could be applied in response to cyber operations. Um, so thinking here, for example, about economic sanctions, um, about really reducing the access of, of certain states or, or markets um, to certain goods. Um, so really make, make the sanctions hurt a bit more. Um, but then also just wanted to share, uh, like more generally, sanctions are a quite imperfect tool. Um, and this is because they are not very nuanced. They are basically, they're a binary tool. So they're either on or off, um, which means that once you've passed sanctions, it's actually quite challenging to lift them. It's politically quite challenging. But once you've passed them, they sort of lose their power almost um, to a certain extent. Uh, this is certainly the case with, with uh, travel bans and asset freezes. So once they are passed, okay, then these certain individuals um, cannot enter uh, the territory, etc. But it, it, since it's so binary, after this, there's little room for anything else you can do. Um, and so this is what I see as the main challenge of sanctions. Um, so ideally, I would argue that if sanctions are supposed to have an effect also on, on these more hybrid actors or maybe non-state actors, um, uh, as well as well as state actors, what would be needed um, is more of an integrated strategy. So not only look at how should we respond to this one cyber operation um, and what, what, should you, what should we do in response, but rather what is the actor we're talking about and what would be really um, hurtful to them, what be what mean and what would be conducive to actually change behavior. I think this is where the, the discussion should go in the future. Thanks. Uh, Koichiro, please. Yep. Uh, sanctions. Uh, so, in short, uh, sanction undermine, und undermine the power of the global community and professional, global professional network. And that's, that's what made me sad in, in this uh, in, in this issue, EU sanction to Russia prevent prohibit right to assign new IP address spaces to 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 Russia, which in the end make vulnerable citizen in Russia more vulnerable. U.S. economic sanction to Chinese tech company uh, prevent first. Uh, it's a forum of incident response team. Uh, their, their global membership organization among cybersecurity experts, which I was part of the board member, but first, uh, prevent first to share cybersecurity information with certain Chinese tech company like Huawei, ZTE, DAFA, and others. So uh, that's not help, well, the, the, I think those sanctions it's very difficult to achieve the tangible uh, strategic outcome, and it has more. Um, um, and and again, I, I, I'm very sad to see those uh, sanctions being uh, being carried out. But aside from my sentiment, uh, if economic sanctions are to be imposed, uh, I think we we must work hard. Uh, to make those sanctions more effective 
um, Russia has kicked out from SWIFT network. Uh, North Korea, DPLK, is not the part of the global financial network. However, uh, you know, more and more uh, financial assets are transferred via uh, cryptocurrency network, like Bitcoin, you, you can name it, other cryptocurrencies. So, and, and, and right now, there's no technical, good technical mean of preventing or prohibiting uh, sending Bitcoin to someone who's in North Korea or Russia. And uh, th that one, we really uh, need to, uh, the, the, the tech community should work harder. That's, that's I can say. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a lot of questions uh, online. And then we have only 20 minutes uh, to end our panel. But I wanted to hand over to Alexandre that will read some of these online questions and perhaps can talk a little bit about our hub in Brazil, sending some of those questions. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Actually, I will straightly hand over to Isadora Peixoto, who is our colleague there in Sao Paulo. I think there are some questions and they can make the, the question themselves. Uh, Isadora, can you open the microphone, please? Hello? And, yes? Yes, good morning, good evening. Uh, my name is Adora. I'm speaking from the Brazilian IGF hub. Please bear with us. We are facing some technical issues. So if you eventually drop the call, be patient. I was, uh, we will come back as we would like to participate in the discussion very much. We have two people here that want to ask questions. Uh, we'll be, be, uh, be brief to listen to, uh, to our panelists. But I'd like to answer, uh, ask a couple of questions. Consider Can you speak a bit, um, not that close to the microphone, please, Isa? Hello. Apologies, everyone. I'll be brief. Um, considering the traditional diplomacy has a variety of formats and limitations, I'd love to hear from our panelists if they believe cyber diplomacy is an opportunity to take diplomacy to a different level, uh, perhaps one more towards of a decision-making approach. That is something that we feel is lacking nowadays. And I would like to know how they view the participation and inclusion of the Global South community in current and future cyber diplomacy discussions. I will take the opportunity to hand over to my colleague that will ask a couple of questions as well. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Camila Leite. I am a lawyer at the Brazilian Institute of Consumer Defense. So uh, I'm a civil society representative. And I would like to ask two questions. Two questions. The first one is cybersecurity and development are two sides of the same coins that are unclear and a challenge to many developing and low economy countries. Could cyber diplomacy work as a bridge between these elements? in which way so. And the second one is that as a civil society representative, I would also ask, what is the civil society role on that and how can we support the advance on these discussions? So thank you and congratulations on the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, any of you want to answer the questions? Uh, I will not point the questions to specifically to anyone. Maybe perhaps you can volunteer to answer. Uh, this is Benny. Benny, please. Uh, thank you. I can answer the last questions because uh, civil society is dear and near to my heart. I, my background is both in civil society and tech. Um, and I'm a lawyer by education as well, so that kind of uh, makes me interested in all these issues. So I, I already mentioned actually that civil society could reach out to representatives of the civil society, you know, organizations if they are existing or, or just, you know, individuals can reach out to their governments if they have the expertise and offer the government their expertise so that uh, when they go and, and engage in negotiations on cyber issues, 
the governmental representatives are better prepared. And also because uh, often the interest of uh, the citizens need to be uh, reminded uh, or protected or defended, you, whatever word you want to use, uh, because in the, in the heat of the negotiations uh, where, you know, there are bigger stakes and norms are discussed and you name it, um, sometimes this can be forgotten. And at the end of the day, the internet would not be what it is without the users, which are all of us are citizens, so all of us should feel part of the civil society. So I think it it has it could have a crucial role. It was very actually instrumental in the first meetings of the World Summit to Information Society in 2003 and 2005. In fact, if it wasn't for the civil society to push the government to open the process, it would not have become what it is now. Uh, so I think uh, this is a good example where civil society had uh, had a real impact on intergovernmental negotiations as they were initially planned. So um, just continue to be engaged or get engaged if you are not engaged. Uh, there are countries which, are very, which can serve as good examples. I don't want to start naming them because I'm sure I will miss a lot. But uh, there are countries also, even those who are doing a lot can do better. And there are countries which haven't done much. So civil society representatives could again engage and this should be done in a in a diplomatic way because you're going to be talking to diplomats so be careful you know don't don't push too much in a in a direction which may be counterproductive but i think um i mean we, this is what we did in bulgaria and it worked well back in uh, more than 20 years ago now and i can only uh, recommend that uh, you know engage positively try them try i will quote what the prime minister back then in bulgaria in 99 said when we when we had to sue them in order to, to achieve what we wanted. He said, if you want the government to solve your problem, you have to make your problem a problem of the government. So I think that's, that's a way to, to work with them uh, in a positive way so that they don't have problems, so that if there is a problem, you help them solve it rather than uh, make it even bigger. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone? I can jump in on the first question, if that's all right, Great. Um, because I think it, it's a really crucial one. So I am, of course, I mean, full disclosure, I'm German. I'm also based in Germany, um, but I wrote uh, my PhD on the role of Brazil in cyber diplomacy and specifically in the development of cyber norms construction. Um, and so through that work or, or research, I really found that um, it is quite astonishing. First, um, on the one hand, to what extent policymakers, but also scholars, um, have overlooked the previous participation of the Global South in cyber diplomacy debates. Um, but then also, on the, on the other hand, it's quite astonishing to what extent, for a really long time, this was, of course, a debate basically among European states, five eyes, and then a few others. Um, but so I think currently there are quite interesting movements um, or attempts uh, to increase um, Global South participation in, in this space uh, when it comes to cyber diplomacy. Um, certainly the establishment of the open-ended working group was a huge step in that direction when really the debate at the United Nations about cyber diplomacy shifted from this very limited behind closed doors format of up to 25 states. And instead now the OEWG, as Vani so well pointed out, is open to all UN member states. Um, and there is even, this now goes a bit into the, the direction of question number two, there is even a very limited role for civil society in these forums, uh, but at least it's, it's open, uh, the liberations are open. And um, there is an accreditation process also for civil society, which includes a veto. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's not perfect at all, um, but it's a huge step in the right direction. Um, and then I, I wanted to share uh, a program that I don't know if, if you're aware of this. Um, I think it's called the Women for Cyber Program, which was launched um, by a couple, a couple of states to increase the participation of, of yeah, women diplomats in this space. Um, specifically in the uh, open-ended working group at the United Nations. Um, but the interesting thing is that not only did the participation of women go up significantly through this uh, through this program, um, I think the Australian delegation 
made uh, they counted the participation and re it really shifted dramatically um, the way women engage in this forum, which in itself is already, I would say, a huge success, um, but also since um, these these diplomats that are part of the fellowship um, uh, are mostly um, located in the global south, it has really shifted the debate and led to really strong voices on the floor uh, coming from, from states of the global south. So in that sense, the program even had like a positive double effect, um, I would say. Um, at the same time, I think that it's, it's still a very long way to go when it comes to global south participation. And it's also a fine line because when we look at the tendency, so Vani laid this out very well, how the cyber diplomacy landscape developed over time. Um, and the more we have different forums aimed at different subtopics of cyber diplomacy, um, on the one hand, of course, the more we can have meaningful discussions on all of these topics. But on the other hand, this also makes it quite tricky for um, states with yeah, limited resources, like maybe smaller countries, but also countries from, from the global south, who now suddenly not only need to send one cyber diplomat to all these forums, but maybe three. Uh, so currently we have at least the OOEWG, then the Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime. Um, and then currently we're debating what shape a program of action could take. Um, so I think there's really this trade-off that is quite challenging for policymakers right now, how to solve this. Thanks, Alexandra. Kuchiru, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to respond to uh, question number two, uh, the role of civil society. I think the, the, the most important role of civil society is go to election, both for right candidate who can represent you and who can fix your problem. Um, and then if, you know, if he, his or her performance is, is not what you expected, Try not to bore him again, him or her again. So that's that's the basic process of at least uh, process of the democratic society. Uh, and democratic society is really heavily relying on the uh, successful or appropriate uh, election. And this election is relatively vulnerable to cyber attack. Uh, you see, if you face it from French presidential election, uh, U.S. presidential election, which was in 2000, I guess, 15, no, 16, and vote over Brexit in U.K., uh, we observed cyber attacks and information operation uh, to manipulate the uh, result. On this particular topic, a group called GCSC published the published a norm uh, saying states should not attack to infrastructure for election or referenda. So I wish you can help uh, help us in promoting this this norm in Brazil and others. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I, I want to open the mic for anyone here on site, if you want to make questions. Anyone? No. So, uh, maybe please we can go to the final remarks of our speakers. Uh, and uh, we can start with Veni, and then Alexandra, and then Koichiru. So this is going to be the reverse of the our the first uh, presentations. Yeah, please. You're, you're making you're 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 closing the circle. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot again. Thanks a lot for the organizers. I was uh, really having. Uh, I, I think I put a comment in the chat when I was looking at the uh, the video from Brazil where there is a hub. You know, that's uh, exactly what we've been trying to to talk about in the past years of the IGF, you know, and I've been on, I've served a couple of times on the multi-stakeholder advisory group that is creating all this, you know, the program of the IGF. Uh, such hubs are extremely important uh, given the time zone difference, but also uh, sometimes it's lack of um, uh, con connectivity, sometimes it's lack of um, if, if you will, video and audio equipment, etc., etc. So it's very important that we we can open this uh, IGF to uh, even more people than participate usually, like several thousand people and several thousand online. 
Um, I, I believe uh, in diplomacy. Uh, if I didn't, you know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Uh, but I also believe that uh, all of us stakeholders, different stakeholders have a place in these uh, uh, conversations. And uh, we, we have to be aware that there are rules of procedure at the UN, at the ITU. And um, when it's a multilateral organization, you know, it's a multilateral organization. We are not going to have equal uh, participation as governments, which is fine. And it's different from the IGF or, or ICANN or other organizations where governments have equal uh, footing with other participants. Uh, but uh, I think the way I cannot stress enough on what I've been saying in the past uh, couple of interventions, the way to do it is really to engage with national governments, to talk to them, to provide them information, factual information about how the internet functions, who is doing what, uh, so that we don't end up in uh, conversations behind closed doors where um, diplomats are talking to each other and somebody says something which is not correct. And I'm, I'm not saying that they say that with whatever purpose they might have, you know, sometimes it's just lack of knowledge of how the internet functions in order to understand that what you're saying uh, or what somebody is saying does not reflect the, the, the actual way of how the internet works. So it's very important that uh, there is more, uh, we provide them with more technical uh, information, with more neutral information, with more information which is factually based. So that when they are negotiating all these um, items that we were discussing, they have the knowledge or if they don't have the knowledge right at the moment, you know, they know that there are organizations that they can reach out and talk to. Uh, I can give again example with my Bulgaria where the Internet Society, a local chapter, you know, has been uh, very actively engaged with the governments in the last 23 years. I mentioned that in 99, we had to sue the government in order to um, get rid of the proposed licenses for the internet service providers, but we, we were very successful and that brought us, you know, even today we are working closely with them. Thank you. And thanks again to the organizers. Thank you, Veni, and thanks for your participation as well. And Alexandra, please, and thanks for your participation too. Yes, thank you. Thank um... you. So I would, I would echo in a sense what Veni said, which is about the multi-stakeholder participation uh, when it comes to these issues, right? I mean, also my impression is that when it comes to many of the topics, I mean, cyber diplomacy is still a huge field. Um, when you look at the issue areas covered by the 11-2015 GGE cyber norms, um, this is still, this includes uh, issues ranging very wide from attribution to critical infrastructure protection to software supply chain security. Um, and in many of these, governments are really not at the forefront. Um, instead, it is, um, it is academia, it's civil society, it's uh, the private sector um, who is currently yeah, developing actionable solutions or maybe who even in a first step um, has insights in how to tackle this problem. And so I think it's really essential um, to, to bring these different communities together uh, and think about how we can translate these insights from different stakeholder groups into policy mm -hmm. recommendations. Um, I'm currently doing this as part of my job here at SMB um, for the field of software supply chain security. And here it's really quite striking how um, different technical community or private sector initiatives um, are, are really looking for practical solutions. Um, at the same time as, as many governments are, are struggling to come to terms with this topic. Um, so this is why I, I think um, forums such as the IGF, but also other multi-stakeholder forums are quite essential to, to develop what would be a meaningful cyber diplomacy 2.0. Um, so yeah, thanks to, to the organizers and thanks to all my co-panelists. I learned a lot from you. It was a pleasure being with you. Thank you, Alexandra. The pleasure was ours. And uh, please, uh, thanks, Koichiro, for your uh, participation and your final remarks, please. Thank you. Uh, you know, great to be part of face-to-face -face and online discussion after 2.5 of uh, absence of trip to overseas. Uh, um, listening to questions and uh, remarks by other panelists, I, I, I started to think about Discussing cyber diplomacy or diplomacy 
is really a luxury thing. I mean, in, in my case, I have government that can represent my position in the, in the uh, global multilateral discussion. And there, not all of us, even in this room, not all of us has, you know, uh, in in that position. Um, and in my region, in, in East Asia, we have lots of lots of issues. So, um, uh, again, in this great discussion at the IGF 2022, um, I really enjoyed the discussion, but I miss, you know, two key countries, uh, China and India. Uh, I think they are underrepresented, well, given the size of their country. And also, uh, the previous IGF in Berlin, I see more representative from Big Tech, from California and DC, and they are not here as much, as, as many as they were in Germany. So, uh, as I said in my initial remark, next year in, in Japan, I think we can fix the, the issue. Uh, many rep representatives from all, all over the world and we could have, you know, even better discussion there. So, thank you so much and looking forward to see you there. Thank you so much, Koichiro. Certainly there's a lot of things to continue discussing and uh, we should keep uh, working to open the, the debate and include as many as people as we can. Thank you everyone for uh, being here. Thank you for everyone who are online and uh, this concludes our workshop. Thanks. Thank you, bye-bye.